Welcome to Illuminati Silver's Inner Sanctum, where we tell you the truth about silver, precious metals, economics and politics. Today is Monday the 25th of March 2019, and we're discussing Baal III and its potential impact on gold and silver. Yesterday we produced a video on this subject to all members. We've provided a link below this video, but for Inner Sanctum members we're going a little deeper. And we're also highlighting towards the end of the video why Baal III may not be so positive for gold prices as many suspect. So what is Baal III? Well, let's address who is responsible for it. Baal, by its name, is a prominent city in Switzerland. Here sits the headquarters of the Bank for International Settlements. It was founded in 1930 out of the Hague Agreements of that year and took over the role of the Agent General for Repatriation in Berlin. Today its role has changed and is highlighted on its website as being quote, to serve central banks in their pursuit of monetary and financial stability, to foster international cooperation in those areas and to act as a bank for central banks. End quote. Despite what we heard from one channel purporting to know that about these things, it is not owned by the Rothschilds, but by 60 central banks representing countries around the world and jointly account for approximately 95% of GDP, so it's very influential indeed. With regard to banking activities, their customers are central banks and international organisations. They do not accept deposits from or provide financial services to private individuals or corporate entities. Bar 1, 2 and 3 are the products from the Bar Committee, initially named the Committee on Banking Regulations and Supervisory Practices, which was established by the central bank governors of the group of 10 countries at the end of 1974 in the aftermath of serious disturbances in international currency and banking markets, notably the failure of Bankhaus Herstadt in West Germany. Since its inception, the Baal Committee has expanded its membership from the G10 to 45 institutions from 28 jurisdictions. At the outset, one important aim of the committee's work was to close gaps in international supervisory coverage so that one, no banking establishment would escape supervision and two, supervision would be adequate and consistent across member jurisdictions. Baal I was essentially the Baal Capital Accord. With the foundations for supervision of internationally active banks laid already, capital adequacy soon became the main focus of the committee's activities, and out of this was established the 1988 Accord, which called for a minimum ratio of capital to risk weighted assets of 8%, to be implemented by the end of 1992. Up to and including 1996, this Accord had been revised. Baal II introduced what was known as the New Capital Framework. It proposed in June 1999 to replace the original 1988 Accord, Baal I, and was formally accepted in June 2004. It consisted of three pillars. One, minimum capital requirements, which sought to develop and expand the standardised rules set out in the 1988 Accord. Two, supervisory review of an institution's capital adequacy and internal assessment process, and three, effective use of disclosure as a lever to strengthen market discipline and encourage sound banking practices. Baal III came about as the committee's response to the 2007-9 financial crisis. According to the Bank for International Settlements website, quote, even before Lehman Brothers collapsed in September 2008, the need for a fundamental strengthening of the Baal II framework had become apparent. The banking sector entered the financial crisis with too much leverage and inadequate liquidity buffers. These weaknesses were accompanied by poor governance and risk management, 
as well as inappropriate incentive structures. The dangerous combination of these factors was demonstrated by the mispricing of credit and liquidity risks and excess credit growth. Unquote. In September 2010, the group of governors and head of supervision or heads of supervision announced higher global minimum capital standards for commercial banks. The proposed standards were issued by the Baal Committee in mid December 2010 and have, as always, been subsequently revised. The enhanced Baal framework revised and strengthened the three pillars established by Baal II and extended it in several areas. We won't go into them here as they're quite complex and extensive. However, it's the revisions and improvements which lead us to today and this we shall direct our attention to. The committee completed its Baal III post-crisis reforms in 2017 with the publication of new standards for the calculation of capital requirements for credit risk, credit valuation adjustment risk and operational risk. So Baal III, in essence, is an international regulatory accord that introduced a set of reforms designed to improve the regulation, supervision and risk management within the banking sector. Largely in response to the credit crisis, banks are required to maintain proper leverage ratios and meet certain minimum capital requirements. The revisions to the regulatory framework was aimed to restore credibility in the calculation of RWA, risk-weighted assets, as a wide range of stakeholders lost faith in banks' reported risk-weighted capital ratios. The three key areas affected are 1. Enhancing the robustness and risk sensitivity of the standardised approaches for credit risk and operational risk which will facilitate the comparability of banks' capital ratios. 2. Constraining the use of internally modelled approaches. and 3. Complementing the risk-weighted capital ratio with a finalised leverage ratio and a revised and robust capital floor. Below this video we attach links to the actual amendments in PDF form. It is complex but well worth a browse. They include the 2017 document plus the January 2019 amendment for minimum capital requirements for market risk. It is important to bear in mind that the final phase of the Baal III Accord are expected to be implemented by the 1st of January 2022 and fully phased in by the 1st of January 2027. Under the Baal Accord, a bank has to maintain a certain level of cash or liquid assets as a ratio of its risk-weighted assets, the RWA mentioned earlier. This is known as the capital adequacy ratio. Under Baal III, a bank's Tier 1 and Tier 2 assets must be at least 10.5% of its risk-weighted assets, up from 8% under Baal II. A bank's capital consists of Tier 1 capital and Tier 2 capital, and the two types of capital are different. There is a third type called Tier 3 capital. Tier 1 capital is a bank's core capital, where Tier 2 capital is a bank's supplementary capital. A bank's total cal capital is calculated by adding its Tier 1 and Tier 2 capital together. Regulators use the capital ratio to determine and rank a bank's capital adequacy, and this is important. Tier 1 capital is intended to measure a bank's financial health. A bank uses Tier 1 capital to absorb losses without ceasing business operations. It is regarded as a bank's core capital. It consists primarily of shareholders' equity and retained earnings and is assessed at 100% of current value. Under Baal III, the minimum Tier 1 capital ratio is 10.5%, which is calculated by dividing the bank's Tier 1 capital by its total risk-based assets. 
Tier 2 capital includes revaluation reserves, hybrid capital instruments and subordinated term debt, general loan loss reserves and undisclosed reserves. Tier 2 capital is supplementary capital because it is less reliable than Tier 1 capital. It is considered less reliable because it is more difficult to accurately calculate and is composed of assets that are more difficult to liquidate. In 2019, under BAL 3, the minimum total capital ratio is 12.9%, which indicates the minimum Tier 2 capital ratio is 2%, as opposed to 10.9% for the Tier 1 capital ratio. So in other words, 10.9% cap Tier 1, 2% Tier 2, add them together, and you end up with total 12.9%. Tier 3 capital consists of Tier 2 capital plus short-term subordinated loans, which in essence means security that ranks below other loans or securities with regard to claims on assets or earnings. And this is normally assessed at 50% of current value. Now, all of the fuss has been generated recently, has been the result of gold historically being classified as a Tier 3 asset. When determining how much money a bank can loan, as a bank's capital or reserve requirement is taken into account in this assessment, the bank's gold holdings have traditionally been discounted 50% of the current market value. Its movement under BAL 3 from a Tier 3 category to a Tier 1 category means that the 50% valuation reduction is removed and so gold is accounted for at full current price. And this takes effect from the 31st of March 2019. Now this has prompted gold bugs to declare that banks will now rush out and buy gold, thereby causing its price to rise dramatically. Well, first of all, we have to take into account the fact that BAL3 and its impact on gold has been known for some time and frankly banks, if they were going to buy it, will have already been doing so. And so this immediate rush on the 31st of March is unlikely. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, and forgive us, this is technical and may prove a little alarming and we have to add that we're about that what we are about to state has to be verified, but it is a position that may very well play out. First, under the current BAL 3 proposed rules, gold is currently not assigned a risk weight for the purposes of assessing bank capital adequacy. Gold only figures into the calculation of the required net stable funding ratio, which is part of the BAL liquidity standards, not the capital standards. Now this is technical, as we've said, but basically it's almost saying that the 50% assessment is not taken into account unless they're looking at liquidity standards as opposed to capital standards. Now, under the net stable funding rules, a bank would have to maintain the ratio of available stable funding to the required amount of stable funding at greater than 100%. Different liabilities count towards the definition of available stable funding. So, for example, Tier 1 and Tier 2 capital, long-term debt and deposits with maturities greater than one year are regarded as 100% stable. Retail deposits with maturities of less than a year are regarded as 85% stable, and so on down to wholesale funding, which is regarded as only 50% stable. Some liabilities are even given zero as a stability weighting. On the asset side, different asset categories are considered to have different liquidity characteristics that require more or less stable funding as a buffer. For example, Cash and short-term unsecured instruments with maturities of less than one year are regarded as liquidity and carry a 0% weight. Debt securities with maturities greater than one year carry a 5% weight. 
corporate covered bonds rated AA or higher carry a 20% weight. Gold, lower rated covered bonds and equity securities carry a 50% weight. Remember that, 50% weight. Retail loans maturing in less than one year have an 85% rate weight, sorry, and some assets that are deemed illiquid carry a 100% weight. The bottom line of all this is that the lower the weight applied to different asset categories, the lower amount of stable funds that the proposed BAL 3 rules would require. Now, what does that mean in reality? If the proposal is to move gold from its 50% weight category to 100%, which is what's happening, that raises the amount of stable funding needed to support gold holdings and presumably and potentially ups or increases the cost of holding gold. Therefore, those arguing that the changes will increase the demand for gold and be bullish for gold valuations may have it backwards. Any change that increases the stable funding ratio will increase the cost of carrying that asset, while any proposal that lowers the net stable funding ratio will be bullish for the asset. Now this is not mentioned almost anywhere, and this is why we are concerned to verify it in case we have got it wrong. But if we are right, and we are 75% confident that we are, then this, will, this move will have the opposite effect of what many claim. However, that said, the irony is that the headlines which this has attracted in the change in weighting will by itself encourage individual investors to buy gold on the expectation, whether correct or not, that the gold price will go up because of bank purchasing. We shall have to wait to see whether our assessment there is actually 100% correct. But it may take a little time as the authorities are not totally transparent on this. With regard to silver, which is not mentioned or covered in these regulations, because as we have often said, it is not regarded as a primary monetary metal by banks, it is, however, regarded as a secondary monetary metal by individual investors and some states in the US and certain smaller countries around the world. So any impact on the price of gold that Baal III may have, either positive or negative, will in fact be reflected by the price of silver by association, as it is often termed poor man's gold. So our conclusion... Yes, we still believe that this ultimately will be positive for gold longer term and for silver because of its association. However, we caution our Inner Sanctum members to be aware of the possibility that Baal III could have a detrimental effect on holding gold. Though on balance, our assessment is that any bank selling, if it does happen, will be outweighed to some extent by private investor purchases, which is why we neither see a dramatic rise nor a dramatic fall in the price of the precious metal. A long video and we apologise, but hope that we have put this subject into some form of perspective. Disclaimer Illuminati silver owners come from a background of banking, international wealth management and economics. Having now retired from these worlds, we are not qualified to give investment advice. Therefore, this and other productions must not be deemed to be giving such advice and merely represent the personal views of its owners.